Welcome back everyone and thank you so much for joining us today for the Time and Navigation online conference. We are just about to jump into our final session. But as a reminder for you, if you missed any of the first three or you'd like to share them with someone who was not able to attend live, we are recording them all and we'll make those archives available on the conference site. So please do be sure to check back there. But we are now going to jump into who can navigate and we are rejoined by Dr. Andrew Johnston who was with us briefly in the very first session. And I'd like to remind all of you that as we move through this final session today, please feel free to type in your comments or questions in the chat box on the left side of the screen. And we'll try to address as many of those as we can during the time today. And if you're just joining us and this is your first session, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box as well. And thanks so much for jumping in for our final session of the day. All right, wonderful. So thank you again, Dr. Andrew Johnston, and we'll uh, turn it over to you to kick things off. Great. Thanks very much, and thanks everybody for being online here, uh, especially to those of you that have been here for uh, some of the other presentations we've had today. If you've been on for a while, you've heard uh, details about the connection between measuring time and measuring place over centuries of history. You've uh, learned some of the details about how this technology worked, uh, and you also learned about how some of those innovations that made it possible have, have come about. For the last section uh, today, I'll be talking about who actually does navigation. Uh, it might be sound like a funny question uh, when, you, when you first hear it, but who can navigate is actually a really interesting question because it turns out that the nature of people that could do navigation has changed a lot over the generations. Before I jump in, I'll give you a brief introduction uh, to me and, and uh, my involvement uh, uh, here at the National Air and Space Museum. Uh, I'm actually a geographer, uh, so I actually, on the research side of my job, uh, study uh, the Earth's land surface using satellite images and how it changes through time uh, and how vegetation cover changes in response to human settlement and things like that. I've also done a lot of work of uh, survey work actually using some of the tools and techniques that I'll be talking about today uh, out in the field measuring the shape and sizes of things like rivers and sand dunes and lava flows and, and things like that. Uh, on the other side of my job uh, I help to develop and write and uh, curate uh, public programs and exhibitions about Earth and space science, uh, and I was on the team with the uh, other people that you heard from earlier today on this time and navigation exhibition. And the whole point of this project is to illustrate to people the connection between determining time and determining position. Um, but as I uh, mentioned just a minute ago, uh, the, who gets to do this has actually changed over the years. If you go back in time only a little, a little while, even just a couple decades, only certain people had the ability to navigate anywhere in the world. Uh, in other words, if we dropped you anywhere on the surface of the Earth, there was a certain kind of uh, set of tools and methods that you could use for determining where you were and how to get to another part of the world. If you wanted to cross an ocean or if you wanted to, wa wanted to walk across a continent, these kinds of things required really advanced tools, special tools, and it took a lot of training and it took a lot of steps to know how to do that. Let's say you were maybe a navigator on board a ship that was crossing the ocean. You needed certain tools and you used certain techniques. But today, that's very different. Today, almost anybody is capable of navigating globally. And the tools that you're used to doing that may be the kinds of things that you, you are familiar with holding in your hand. Things like uh, mobile devices, whether they're phones or small computers, can determine their position using satellite navigation tools. And it enables uh, almost anybody with the right tools to get from point A to point B. So I'm going to be talking about the history of that and how actually the, the nature of global navigators has changed over the years. And I'll finish up with a discussion about some of the current things that people talk about with global navigators. Who gets to do it and how and what are uh, some of the uh, issues and concerns that people have with uh, global navigation and, and positioning uh, today. But let's start by going back in time. So, so let me take you back in time about 300 years. So this is a time period where there were uh, ships crossing the ocean very commonly. There were thousands of ships going across uh, the Atlantic Ocean between Europe and North America. There were ships entering the Pacific Ocean and going all over the place. Uh, and uh, most of these, a lot of these ships anyway, were originating from uh, European nations. 
Uh, in order to get across the oceans, you needed to use special equipment, and it was complicated and difficult. It took a lot of uh, uh, tools and techniques. There's just a couple of uh, pictures here. These are the kind of guys that would, uh, uh, these are both uh, sea captains. The, the one on the right is uh, Charles Wilkes. He commanded a the U.S. Exploring Expedition starting in 1838. And on the left is just a hypothetical sea captain character that we actually have in our exhibition. He's wearing a uniform patterned after what Wilkes is wearing. Uh, but in order to actually navigate at sea, you need to determine your position based on the measurement of time. Now, for those of you that weren't here this morning, where we did actually talk about um, how, how this actually works a little bit, I'll give you a very brief overview. If you could actually measure time, uh, you could actually compare what a timepiece says to what the Earth, of, the rotation of the Earth tells you about the position of stars and the, and the sun in the sky. So in other words, you needed a timepiece. There's a chronometer pictured on the left of the screen. And you needed a, an, another kind of instrument called a sextant, which measures angles in the sky that allow you to determine a position of, say, a star up in the sky. And by combining those two kinds of information, uh, because the star that you see pictured there is going to change its position in the sky as the Earth rotates, right? So if you can measure that position of that star, and if you can measure the time uh, from your timepiece, and then there's a lot of complicated math you need to do and write it down. Uh, uh, you need to get information from uh, log books and tables and then draw out your position on a chart. It took many, many steps, but a skilled navigator could determine their latitude and their longitude, you know, their position anywhere on the Earth, uh, you know, after uh, many steps. Uh, this uh, developing this kind of technique took a long time. Uh, people had to first invent uh, clocks that uh, worked accurately. I think other presenters have talked about that today. They also needed to invent uh, and develop the sextants. There's a sextant on the right there that would precisely measure angles. And then it took a long time for people to learn these techniques. It was a system that had to be developed so that mariners at sea could determine their position and they could get across the ocean and know exactly where they were, they were going all the time. But in order for you to do this, in order to be a navigator, you were a person that worked uh, um, in, a, in, a, in a service where you received a lot of training. So you, you took many weeks of training to learn how to actually use that sextant and all the different steps. You had to understand the math uh, that, that went into play. Uh, and then you were issued a sextant and then a chronometer. The chronometer on board these vessels was potentially the most important thing on board the ship. Some of these ocean-going vessels uh, carried many chronometers, and they were locked away so that potentially only the captain and only the navigator had keys to this special cabinet. So these were like, very expensive pieces of equipment. Uh, they were tested extensively before they were sent out to sea. It took a long time to de develop these things. So the point I'm trying to make here is that it is not the case that just anybody could go out there and determine latitude and longitude. It was very special people. Even most people on the ship couldn't do it. Only the navigator was specially trained to do these things. And here's just a brief idea of, of why, to give you a brief idea of why it's important to actually measure that time. Again, I know this has been briefly covered in the previous uh, uh, presentations, but I wanted to illustrate why that time measurement uh, is important. If you start over here where the cursor is right now, you can see the ship leaves maybe from this port here. They can measure the time with their timepiece right here, and they know the sun is at its highest point in the sky. Well, if you're at sea a couple days later, maybe you're over here, and now the clock says, the clock indicates, look, it's noon again, but now the sun is not directly at its highest point in the sky. It's a little bit off. So if you read this clock, if you can measure this angle difference right here where the cursor is, that tells you how many degrees east or west you've moved. The main point to take home here is that this is a complicated process, and it takes a lot of training, a lot of work to, to understand these kinds of things. I see there's a question on there right now. Is that does anybody use an advanced sextant today? Um, if I'm going to go back to this previous uh, graphic here. See, I'm drawing with the cursor there. That's what a sextant looked like. Uh, this was a sextant made by Jesse Ramsden, uh, an Englishman. He designed navigation uh, equipment. We have actually this object on display in the Time and Navigation exhibition. Sextants today don't look very different from that. There's not really much more you could add to the sextant to make it, say, more, more useful or, or more accurate. The way this sextant works um, is uh, you see the graphic of somebody, uh, what she's doing is she's measuring the altitude of a star in the sky. What a sextant does is it measures how many degrees above the horizon a star is. So a person would hold this uh, with their right hand and they'd look with their eyeball through this tube right here. This is a little telescope. And if you look through the telescope, this is what you see. 
right here. So that as you look uh, towards the horizon, you point this little tube directly towards the horizon line, and half of the field of view, you look towards the horizon. There's the horizon right there. But the other half of the field of view has these mirrors. So the, the, the light actually, if you, if you follow my cursor here, the light from the star comes in at this angle, then it bounces off a mirror here, bounces off another mirror here, and goes into the, into the telescope. So your field of view looks like this. Half your field of view is looking up in the sky. The other half of your field of view is looking at the horizon. What you do is you see this arm right here. This moves forward and backward along this arc right here. So you use your other hand to push this forward or backward. What that does is it tilts the mirror right here. So as you push this arm forward, this view of the sky goes higher and higher. What you do is you push it forward until the star you're interested in lines up with the horizon. And then you take the, you, you take the sextant off of your eye and you read this part right here. And there's a scale. And that scale tells you exactly how many degrees above the horizon the star is. Think of it as a fancy protractor. That's all it is. This is measuring angles up in the sky. In fact, you can measure, these things were so precise, you could measure fractions of an angle. But this was true even with sextants, this one's made out of brass, that were made maybe 200 years ago. So today, you can still use a sextant. They have pretty much the same features. The only other features that, that you can see here, see these things right there? Those are solar filters. So you could actually measure the altitude of the sun of course, you don't want to go blind, so you would swing these into, into the view so that it would block out most of the light. So uh, today, so today, the sextant you, you might use has all uh, the same features. Uh, less, fewer and fewer people do use a sextant. This is a process we call celestial navigation. That means looking at objects in the sky to do navigation. But the, the, the sextant tool is the same. I see another question uh, now uh, Jordan is asking, what about chronometers? Well, that's actually what I'm going to get into in, in just a bit that um, in order to determine latitude and longitude for what they needed centuries ago, a mechanical chronometer, like the one you see on the screen right now, was good enough. It could keep time precise down to a second for, you know, say for many months at a time, for instance. Um, but these days, the needs of navigation are much higher. Nowadays, it's not enough to know your position within a couple miles. You need to know where you are much more precisely. So you actually need much more precise time, things like atomic clocks on GPS. Um, and I'll get into explaining that in just a minute. I think we already covered this. So let's move into navigation in the air. So I just explained the celestial navigation techniques where people on board ocean-going vessels uh, would use sextants and chronometers. Well, in the 20th century, where airplanes were up in the sky, there was also a need for navigation. What they did is they used the same celestial techniques. You would use a sextant and a chronometer. The big difference is that on board the airplane, uh, there's less room, so the devices need to get smaller. So the chronometers that you would use on uh, on board a ship would be something you could uh, you know you could carry in a box. Whereas for airplanes, it, they got them small enough so that you would wear them as timepieces on your wrist, so that it was easy to fit into uh, the cockpit of an airplane. But also, it had to work a lot faster. When you were navigating at sea, it might take you a little while—10, 15, 20 minutes. Uh, to d determine how, wh what your position was. On board an aircraft, that's not fast enough. Airplanes are moving at hundreds of miles an hour. So you really need to determine position a lot faster. Uh, so people uh, developed uh, systems for determining position on board airplanes, still using those same celestial techniques. All the, the, um, the, 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 the methods were roughly the same. All the principles are identical. But it was just miniaturized, and it worked a lot faster. And here you see a picture of, on the right there is, is, is a painting of a real uh, World War II navigator. He's in, near the, uh, the front of this uh, bomber aircraft, and that's the navigator. I'll get my cursor up here. Uh, this is the navigator right here, and you can see that he's working. He's got his clipboard out there, and he's got his uh, flight computer and so forth. And he's actually doing the, all the calculations used to determine uh, the position so they can get to where they're where they're trying to go. And on the left is just, a, again, a hypothetical character we have uh, on display in the exhibition based on what these guys uh, would have been wearing, how they would have been working. But again, the same principle is in effect here. These, these people that are doing this kind of navigation, it's not just anybody that gets to get up and, and do this. Uh, all of these people received a lot of training and specialized equipment. Um, during World War II, there was a real need for a lot of air navigators, so they trained a lot of people, thousands of people, to, to, to do this. Um, but it was still only those special people that were, uh, in this case, in military services, uh, that got that training and got access to the equipment that would enable them to determine, say, latitude and longitude and do it quickly uh, any time in the world. 
Now, uh, going back before World War II, uh, there was a, a time period where navigators could really um, uh, could really do uh, amazing things. On the left is a drawing of the Winnie May, which is an aircraft we have on display in the Time and Navigation Exhibition uh, in uh, at the Air and Space Museum. This aircraft flew around the world twice in 1931 and 1933, piloted by Wiley Post. Uh, but we like to tell the story of the navigator. His name is Harold Gaddy. Uh, they're actually pictured in this picture here um, on, on the right. Uh, back then, if you navigated across uh, across a continent or let's say you navigated around the world like these two did, it was a big deal. In fact, if you navigated around the world, there's Gaddy right there, you can meet the president. There's there's President Hoover right there, and there's, there's, there's Post uh, standing uh, next to him. So this is an era where, where feats of, of navigation whether you're at sea or in the air, were really celebrated. Um, in the drawing here, I just should say that up here, this is where the pilot would be in the aircraft, and there's your big gas tank for this long-term flight, and then there's where the navigator would would uh, would be right there. He would use his sextant as, and his chronometer for determining position, and it was such a big deal, you got to meet the U.S. president. Um, so keep track of, keep that in your mind as we talk about who gets to navigate uh, uh, down the road, because things do change. Now we're getting into the uh, second half of the 20th century where navigation in space is an important question. In order to get something uh, from point A to point B on the Earth is complicated, but getting from point A to point B in space is even more complicated. Uh, up here we have again one of these characters, he's an astronaut that helps explain space navigation to our visitors in the Air and Space Museum. On the right there is a picture of navigators uh, actually working at the Jet Propulsion Lab. They're actually planning a maneuvering uh, uh, a maneuver of a mission that's in currently that was currently in orbit around the moon. So they're discussing how to actually maneuver their spacecraft uh, so that it stays on track. In order to navigate in space, it took very advanced techniques. Uh, what you're doing is uh, the previous discussion. Uh, if you were there, the previous presentation, you heard about Doppler shift. What we're doing is, is these engineers measure the, the frequency shift, the Doppler shift of these radio signals coming from spacecraft. And based on that information, they can determine the three-dimensional position of an aircraft. And they can determine its velocity so that they know that it's on track. And they know the shape of its orbit, even if it's around another planet. Or in this case, the moon, uh, as you see uh, in this picture uh, right here. Uh, instead of single people doing heroic feats of navigation, remember the last picture, I'll go backwards just briefly, there's, there's again our, our we, call it, we like to call it the hero shot of, of our air navigator, um, uh, he's a lone guy using the tools to navigate around the world. Now it takes teams of people. So it's not just one, one person, but it's whole groups of people. Uh, the group of pe uh, people on the right there are the folks responsible for for designing the uh, commands that are sent to the spacecraft to use its tiny little thrusters so that it can stay on track. But there are other teams of people that do things like measure the gravity field of the entire solar system, which is what you, you need to do to accurately uh, position these spacecraft. Uh, there are other people that design the trajectory. So once you know how much gravity pull is, is gravitational pull is coming from one planetary body and another, you can design a, a, a trajectory to, so that you can get your spacecraft to your final destination uh, the quickest way possible or the way that requires the least amount of energy. Uh, and so there are multiple teams of people that have to work together and it, and it takes a lot of time and energy. Um, so in this case we're moving to a time period where it's not just single people going out there and navigating, but it does take a whole groups of people. But they're still very specialized folks. These all the people you see on the picture on the right all have advanced degrees in either science or engineering. And uh, again, they're not just using specialized sextants or chronometers, but they're using very advanced computers. And of course, these are missions that that's, that, that cost uh, a lot of money and, and a lot of devote a lot of resources to to make happen. Uh, one example that we have. Uh, in the exhibition is a mission called Mariner 10. Uh, that uh, copy of that spacecraft is hanging from the ceiling. It was the first mission to do something that we call gravity assist. What it did is it was the first mission to Mercury, but in order to get there, it flew by Venus first. And they did that so that it required less rocket fuel to get there. It was a trajectory that enabled it to get to Mercury uh, using a smaller rocket. It really made the whole mission possible. And it was the first time a, a mission did that, going from uh, going between planets anyway. It wasn't possible unless you could hit a very tiny uh, target at a place like uh, uh, Venus. I'll get to the moon in just a second. Uh, and that was only possible in the 1970s with Mariner 10. Before the 1970s, of course, people were navigating to the moon. And here's a shot um, uh, of, of the Apollo 8 crew. 
Apollo 8 was an interesting uh, uh, mission because uh, they actually tested these celestial navigation techniques on board uh, this mission. The same kind of techniques that people used on board ships and airplanes, you could also use in space. So there's a picture of astronaut Jim Lovell uh, on the right there. He's actually looking through a sextant on board the spacecraft. Uh, this picture was taken when they were coming back from the moon. And it, what it did is it, again, remember, it's just a fancy protractor. Uh, you can measure the angle between the star, star, uh, certain stars and the moon. That would enable you to narrow down your position out there in space. Well, they developed this sextant system, but they also used the, what we call these radiometric techniques, where you can measure the Doppler shift of those signals to determine position. They actually did both during the Apollo 8 mission. And very early on, they, they uh, realized that uh, there were some advantages to using the radio techniques instead of using the sextant techniques. So um, the subsequent Apollo missions that sent people to the moon, uh, they actually didn't use the sextant uh, uh, very much. Apollo 8 was probably the last time that autonomous navigation happened, at least using celestial techniques um, on board the spacecraft, where, when it was experimented with extensively, uh, at least. And nowadays, all the uh, spacecraft that are out there, use, uh, they measure the Doppler shift of these, of these signals. I see a question about what was so special about the Winnie Mae equipment. Um, the, the, the navigation equipment that was, uh, that was used on, on the Winnie Mae flights uh, was somewhat, uh, w was, was also accessible to other uh, pilots and navigators a at the time. What was really special about the Winnie Mae uh, flights was that there were these round-the-world flights really proving that you could do this uh, navigation uh, for long periods of time and, and get between very distant uh, places. Uh, the the uh, subsequent flights and the Wiley Post uh, did in the Winnie Mae were very high altitude flights. So for that particular aircraft, it's more a story of how the, the techniques that have been developed were really pushed uh, to their limit to, to enable these, these very long distance uh, flights, uh, not so much the specific um, uh, sextants and chronometers uh, that they used. Although they did have a magnetic compass on board that was so good and Wiley Post loved it so much, he actually took it off the aircraft and used it on other flights. Uh, including, unfortunately, the 1935 flight where he, he crashed and, and perished um, in Alaska w along with uh, Will Rogers on board. And, th and that compass is actually uh, on display in the gallery uh, as well next to the aircraft. So we've talked about navigation at sea, navigation in the, in the air, and navigation in space. Uh, now we come to more recent time where we, we talk about satellites for navigation. In other words, we're not navigating in space. It's sort of like navigating from space. We're using Earth-orbiting satellites to determine our position down here on the Earth. A few things to say about uh, satellite navigation, uh, that these systems were developed for very specific purposes, uh, uh, were wide-ranging purposes, but they had specific uh, objectives in mind, and it takes a lot of people behind the scenes to get all these systems to work. On the right here, you see um, uh, uh, somebody at the uh, uh, GPS Control Center, which is uh, at an Air Force Base in Colorado. Uh, she's looking over the health of the spacecraft, uh, looking at the computer monitors there. And on the left, again, is one of our hypothetical characters based on somebody that uh, uh, was, was in the Air Force and actually using GPS uh, out in the field. So these are people in military services um, uh, doing some... Uh, and also, I say, uh, as it says here, specialized survey organizations where they want very precise information for determining position. Uh, in the military field, of course, uh, satellite navigation is used for determining position on the ground, but then positioning uh, and also guiding uh, weapons, uh, missiles, rockets, and things like that, which were some of the original uh, intended applications for uh, things, uh, satellite systems like GPS. Uh, but they're also used for uh, surveyors, so we're still looking at uh, people uh, doing very advanced uh, uh, things with satellite navigation. On the right here is a he's a professional surveyor that was working down in uh, Florida, and he's holding a very early GPS receiver. Uh, I think people that use think about GPS today are used to using it through their mobile phones, but back uh, this the picture that you're seeing there was taken in about 1989, uh, maybe 1990, um, in in that time frame. And that's what GPS devices looked like back then. Uh, they were, when we say they're shaped like bricks, they, they were. Now, it wasn't as heavy as a brick, so, you know, if you drop this on your toe, it would hurt, but it wouldn't break the toe. Um, and the way this, uh, the way it worked back then, get, get the cursor up. So there's the screen where you get the readout of your position. You'd push these buttons here, and there's the antenna that would receive signals uh, from the satellites. You would have to unfold the antenna and needed to point straight up. I've actually used this kind of uh, receiver myself. Um, uh, 
of in in subsequent years. But these devices, especially in say the 1990 time frame, were not really intended for um, the general public to widely use. These were not being carried around by people, you know, walking around on on, on street corners. They were meant for uh, for people like surveyors, like the guy you see in the picture uh, right there. I've used devices like that for uh, back in the 1990s for measuring. Um, uh, the location of, of field plots, if we're trying to measure the differences between what we see in, in Earth orbiting satellites and what we see on the ground. So you want you need a latitude and longitude, even you're out in the middle of nowhere, you can pull out a, a GPS receiver like that and it lists out that latitude and longitude. On the left is a former uh, colleague, he's retired now, but he, he worked at the Air and Space Museum. That's a picture of him out in the western desert of Egypt. And he's actually uh, with a car um, that you can't see it, uh, but what they've done is they've rigged up a 50-gallon drum of gasoline in the, in the back of the car, um, and it actually uh, has a, a, a range of many thousands of miles because, of, because it has so much extra fuel. But what it's also hard to see, but I'll point out, you see this black object on the top of the, those are sleeping bags behind there, but that black object is actually um, a, a compass, and right next to it uh, is, a, is a, an antenna for receiving satellite signals, but not GPS signals. Most everybody has heard of GPS, but you might not be aware that there were systems that predated GPS. The main one is called Transit. It was operated by the U.S. Navy uh, up through the very early 1990s, but and it was used uh, by the Navy for determining where their vessels were on the ground, and the, the vessel would receive those signals from the transit satellites. It would measure the Doppler shift, and based on the known location of the satellites, it could figure out its position on the Earth. Well, civilians, non-military people, could also use Transit. And so uh, this is my... Uh, this is my, my colleague, uh, Ted, there, um, uh, used a transit receiver in this vehicle to figure out where they were out in the western desert when you've you got a desert that doesn't have very many landmarks and you don't know where you are. And, yes, sometimes it is a dirty job. I've been, I've been with Ted out in the western desert on some of those trips, and you're, you're still finding sand in your hair after a week coming back. Well, today, th times have changed. Who can do global navigation? The answer is you can. Uh, with the right tools, almost anybody is capable of global navigation. Here's a picture, again, another hypothetical uh, character, and she's holding a mobile phone in her hand. Anybody with that kind of device is capable of figuring out where they are, um, and, and, and it's helpful, at least, for figuring out where they want to go to. This is very different than in the past. Even if you were to go back in time only, I don't know, only 20 years. I was talking about 1990s earlier. It was only special people that had access to even GPS devices. They were very expensive. They were a little bit hard to use. Whereas nowadays, these things are integrated into the mobile devices that people carry around with them uh, every day. And so people have at their fingertips the ability to determine not only their location, but to get map information to figure out where they're going. That earlier GPS device that I pointed out before that was the shape and size of a brick, what it would do is it would list out latitude and longitude. And so they were numbers um, that were very useful to professional surveyors and to people in military services, and actually people like me when I was doing you know, surveying and, and field work out there. Those were very useful numbers. But you know, for most people, those aren't really, that's not really terribly useful information. It's only with the integration of digital map data that uh, you can really get a sense for how this kind of uh, positioning technology can uh, can get used. So people are getting more and more used to using mobile devices for getting those uh, directions from point A to point B. And uh, and right now, you, you see on, on the screen right now on the right, you see that that's a handheld GPS receiver. So it's a receiver, it's a device that receives signals from GPS satellites and, and can tell you your position. And on the left, there's just an example of turn by turn directions. Um, that people are used to seeing right now. In fact, I'm sure a lot of people online right now uh, can come up with examples for using the directions, whether they're walking or whether they're in the car or, or, or anything like that. And in fact, the, the, the picture on the right that's on the screen right now uh, pretty soon might be, um, uh, might be getting a little bit more obsolete because folks are, are less likely to be carrying GPS devices. Nowadays, it's included in your mobile phones, and so that's how people are accessing uh, this kind of technology. Now, I briefly want to talk about what makes GPS so simple to use for people on the ground. Uh, if you saw uh, the uh, last presentation, you, you saw a version of this. Uh, but if you weren't there, let me just briefly explain very quickly how GPS works and why it's able to do what it does. The way GPS works is that we have multiple satellites in orbit. We know the shape 
of the orbits uh, because we track the radio transmissions on the ground. Uh, that's actually done at tracking stations all over the world. That information is put together at uh, the GPS operations uh, center, which is, as I said, a U.S. Air Force center. And all of that information about the shape and size of the orbits of the satellites is, is transmitted data up to the satellites. Now, all of those satellites are actually transmitting simultaneously down to the surface of the Earth. On board each satellite is a, are very precise atomic clocks. And those clocks are used to synchronize the transmissions. These are coded signals. So that all the satellites transmit at the, the exact same bits and bytes, if you will, at the exact same time. But depending where you are on the Earth, you're going to receive some signals sooner than others. In other words, this hypothetical situation is somebody standing right here. So the, the signal from, say, this satellite is going to arrive just a split second before the signal from this satellite because the speed of light is constant and this satellite is just a little bit closer at this given second. And you can see we're, it's down to thousandths of a second difference. This signal arrived two thousandths of a second before this signal. Now that might seem like a tiny split second, but what the device in your hand is able to do is determine that offset of thousandths of a second and it measures that offset with a precision of a few billionths of a second. Now, I'm happy to answer questions down the road if people are really curious about, about how that works, but just for now, let's move on. And, and, and I just wanted to make the point that it all works because we measure those billionths of a second using those atomic clocks, those very precise atomic clocks that are on board the spacecraft. We're measuring the amount of time it takes for a signal to move at the speed of light to the palm of your hand. And the way it makes it very simple is that all of, the, all of this hardware I just mentioned, whether it's the atomic clocks or all the transmitters, the large transmitters, are up in space. They're up on board of the spacecraft. They're not in the palm of your hand. The device in the palm of your hand can be very small and very portable because it, the signals are not very high power, so it can receive those signals as long as you're outside. As I'm sure a lot of you are aware, satellite positioning tends to not work very well uh, inside. It doesn't work inside in most cases. Even if you're near a lot of trees or buildings, it might not work because you can't receive those signals. And the system was designed intentionally from that, uh, from that standpoint from day one. They, uh, the designers of the system uh, back in the 1970s wanted it to work in a way so that the devices that, pe that people would carry would be very small uh, and very portable. So who can navigate today? Well, it's not just people in the military. These days, people from all walks of life can, uh, can navigate uh, in their jobs and in their everyday lives. On the picture here are just two examples. If, if you're engaged in agriculture, um, that's actually a soybean farmer in Iowa on the left there. And he is using satellite navigation as he's, uh, as he's, as he's both cultivating but also harvesting crops. In the cab of his equipment here, uh, there's actually this box over his head right here is actually listing out uh, which satellites are being received, but it's also making a map in near real time of the crop yields as he harvests the crops. And what that allows him to do is he puts that information to a computer. It helps the farmer determine how much fertilizer to put down for the next growing season, for example. Precision, they call it precision agriculture, and it's completely changed large-scale agriculture all over the world. It's also a completely changed the way goods are shipped and transported uh, all across the country. Uh, whether you're in the business of, uh, of shipping goods from, uh, from continent to continent on board large you know, ships, or if you're using trains or trucks, these days all of these systems incorporate satellite positioning, and they incorporate satellite positioning from a central office. In other words, if you run a railroad or if you run a, sh a trucking company, you're, uh, it's a lot easier to keep track of all your trucks and all your trains from a central location so you know, you know where they're located. And that enables uh, people to plan shipments with greater efficiency and they can get there uh, right on time, not too late and even not too early. And even on the right here, you see somebody selling produce. That's a fruit stand right there where it, it, it helps those uh, retail outlets get goods uh, on the right time. And then even all the way to getting goods to your home. Uh, maybe when your family is going to the grocery store, you're using satellite positioning to find out where the store is or where you want to go to the restaurant or anything like else like that. So all of these steps in terms of transportation uh, and, and delivery of goods from the farm to, say, a manufacturing position to a retail outlet all the way to your home, there are different people engaging in, in, in navigation. They're doing global navigation, even if they're not aware of it, because they're using these tools that have become uh, common all over the world. Now, a question that comes up is, will these systems always work? 
right now we use uh, GPS and satellite positioning on a regular basis. It's very common. Uh, but uh, are these systems uh, always going to be here? Well, there are some legitimate uh, questions that come up. Things like solar activity can actually interfere with radio transmissions that come from Earth orbiting satellites to the ground. Uh, the, sol the sun goes through cycles of activity. Uh, the, uh, the next time the sun will be at maximum activity will be a time period years from now when people will probably be even more using these satellite systems even more and be more dependent on these systems. Uh, it's also, uh, uh, radio interference is also a concern. Unintentional, but even intentional radio interference. It's possible that some systems may, uh, uh, may sort of step on the GPS signal. It's even possible to jam GPS signals with, with uh, devices uh, that are very illegal to use, but people do uh, s sometimes try to, try to uh, interfere with, this, uh, with the operations of GPS. So uh, what's going on right now is that, that systems like GPS are very robust. They're actually not, they're easy for most people to use and they're somewhat difficult to interfere with. But that's not to be said that improvements can't be made. Right now there are thousands of uh, engineers and scientists out there trying to figure out how to make these systems even more robust so that they're even more useful. Uh, you're going to see innovations in uh, ground-based backups so that in case there is an interference with GPS, there's another kind of radio signals that are coming in from uh, ground-based uh, signals that can that can help you out. You're going to see uh, solutions for things like indoor navigation. I would just uh, mentioned a minute ago that satellite positioning doesn't work uh, almost all the time when you're inside a building, but there are other ways, other kinds of radio signals that you can use to actually navigate inside buildings. So it's a story of integrating satellite navigation technology with other kinds of sensors, sensors that sense the movement of people and inside a, a, your handheld devices that will allow uh, the device to keep track of position even if you're temporarily out of link uh, with these satellite systems. People often wonder who's in charge and who runs these kinds of uh, systems. Uh, in fact, um, the, sometimes people use GPS uh, uh, to refer to sort of satellite positioning in general. Well, in fact, GPS is the name of a specific system operated by the U.S. government. Uh, and uh, but there are other satellite navigation systems that are either working or in development uh, by other nations. You see the global map here. They're color coded different groups of nations that are doing uh, different uh, uh, types of satellite navigation. And around the side are, are logos of di of those different systems. Uh, the big uh, main other system is called GLONASS. It's operated by Russia. Uh, it was uh, developed. Uh, uh, back during the Cold War, just like uh, GPS was uh, in the U.S. Uh, as a, a solution for satellite navigation. Uh, there is a consortium of European countries that are working on developing a system called Galileo, which will have uh, a lot of similarities with GPS, uh, but also some, uh, some differences. Uh, China has uh, stated their intention to uh, create a global satellite navigation system. Both Japan and India uh, have uh, declared uh, the, uh, their intention to uh, develop regional systems. In other words, satellite positioning systems that would work for their part of the world. They wouldn't necessarily be global, uh, global systems. GPS is a system, as I said, operated uh, by uh, the U.S. government, the U.S. Defense Department, in coordination with civilian parts of, of the U.S. Uh, government. Um, at, but it is available to anybody around the world at no cost. Uh, so, so, so you might wonder, well, why are these other countries developing their own systems. They're investing a lot of time and money and resources doing it. The answer is because uh, just like centuries ago when people were developing uh, solutions to determining latitude and longitude, different nations uh, had global ambitions and they wanted to have independent capabilities. So these are other countries that want to have their own systems that work independently of the US uh, GPS system. Now in the end, uh, the uh, multiple systems up there is potentially actually going to be better for everybody using satellite positioning because the devices that you may carry in your hand can actually use multiple systems that are up there right now. In fact, there are some mobile devices that are available right now. Some people listening might be carrying these things that use not only GPS signals, but they're capable of using signals from both GLONASS and Galileo uh, satellites. And if you combine all of these systems, it just gives you more satellite signals up there in the sky that enables you to determine your position potentially more accurately, but also uh, faster And, and if, uh, if a certain part of the sky is blocked by buildings or trees or, or something like that. 
So these mobile devices are proliferating. I mean, people are you know carrying them uh, all over the place. That gives us a lot of advantages. It's really very powerful to be able to determine your position anywhere you want uh, in, in the world at any time, as long as your battery doesn't go dead, of course. But there are some people that do wonder about some of the changes that this has wrought and some of the and and some of the both positives and and negatives. Uh, one of the ones is is about sharing location. Uh, some people actually do bring up concerns about about knowing the location, knowing your own location is one thing, but what about sharing the location? Some people do raise things like privacy concerns. Uh, there are automobile systems that can keep track of positions of cars, which gives you ter uh, very important advantages if something happens to the car, if it's stolen, or if there's an accident. But uh, but some people might not want to know exactly where, uh, what not, might not want to, a central system to know exactly where the car is located. Another question people raise is, what about the loss of skills? When was the last time you actually read a paper map? Now, I know some people uh, who are uh, probably were frustrated about folding paper maps are probably happy to see them go away. But um, And for some people, using mobile devices to navigate might actually help their sense of direction because there's this idea of keeping an overhead view in your mind all the time. Other folks ask questions, as you see on the newspaper story on the left there, are people losing their sense of direction? Do you do anything just because the box tells you to do so? And there's some pretty infamous stories of people driving off piers and getting lost because the GPS box on their dashboard told them to go there, and they're maybe not always using common sense. This isn't to say that these systems are necessarily good or bad. It's just that there are uh, some uh, questions that, that people do raise about, uh, about the impact, whether it's social or technological, on some of these systems. And folks will continue to, to discuss uh, these kinds of impacts. So today, we've got a planet of billions of people, of course, uh, and, and a lot of them uh, with uh, access. Actually, I've got an interesting question that came up. Before I finish up, let me address this. Um, can GPS be used in another country since it's run by the United States? The answer is yes. Uh, the, the global positioning system is actually accessible to anybody anywhere in the world. If you take one of these devices, um, it works globally. Sometimes you'll read things that say it, it works better in some parts of the world than others, but it, is, it was designed intentionally so that it works anywhere in the world, even if you're at the North Pole and the South Pole, you'll be able to get enough GPS satellites to, to get a fix. Um, whether or not it's always accessible uh, in a time of conflict has been a question that, that has come up. Uh, but as the system is run right now, there is a requirement to keep the system always accessible no matter what's going on. There, um, the, the not, right now, the majority of users are not in the military. Most of, most of the users are just using it in their everyday lives or these large systems like transportation. And so there is a guarantee by the US government that it, it will be always available. But these other countries do want, they do desire an independent capability because they are not part of the United States, for instance. So even though they can use GPS all the time, and they do, by the way, there, there's, uh, you know, transportation systems use GPS all, all over the world. That's, that's why those other countries are, are developing their other systems. Right, so just to, just to finish up here with a few last thoughts, uh, as you see on the screen there, we live in this connected world. On the screen right now is an artist rendition showing shipping routes bo uh, both at sea and in the air. It's kind of a fanciful rendition. But just to make the point that there are uh, there were thousands of ships at sea maybe a few hundred years ago. Now there's tens of thousands going everywhere. And there's hundreds of thousands of people boarding airplanes all the time. And, and we really do live in a, a connected world where people are traveling all the time and going everywhere. And we've become almost dependent on these systems. People are used to getting, you know, uh, being able to buy fresh produce in the winter in the cold parts of the world because it's shipped from, from a different part of the, you know, a different part of the world. And that's partially due to the um, enhanced navigation technology that gets, to, uh, that gets ships uh, to the, the ports right where they're trying to go. And so just a few questions and interesting things to think about that I think most people don't think about, but uh, you get the chance to think about it because you're joining us with this online conference. Um, how do you depend on worldwide systems? Uh, things like GPS. How often do you use GPS every day? What do you think your life would be like if you didn't uh, have those kinds of positioning technologies in the palm of your hand? Um, it would probably change your life a lot. If, you're, uh, if you've been around uh, like I have long enough to know what it's like to navigate uh, with paper maps and without 
uh, mobile uh, devices, uh, you'd probably go back to doing what you used to do in the past. But, you know, if, if you've grown up in a world where you're used to using mobile devices, that might be a significant change. And then one last thought to, to sort of think about is what kind of navigation tools would you like to see created in the future? Or would you like to invent? Right now, we're used to using these mobile devices with satellite navigation. They solve a lot of problems, but there are a lot of things they can't do. I mentioned some of the things earlier. You can't navigate inside buildings. Uh, sometimes these systems, the communication links don't always uh, work, even if you have uh, satellite positioning. You're not always in range of a cell phone tower, things like that. Um, so it, just try to imagine what your life would be like without these systems, but also imagine what, your life would like, what you'd like your life to be in the future, because these kinds of technologies, we've just taken you through 300 years of change uh, in the four presentations today. Uh, the change is not over. There's uh, more changes coming as more scientists and engineers are developing the, the uh, and trying to solve the challenges of today. And uh, if you're still learning about these technologies now, you can. If you're still in school, you can help play a role in developing some of these solutions down the future. And uh, they finish just by inviting you to visit uh, the website there, timeandnavigation.si.edu, and come on down to the museum if you're able. Thanks very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Wonderful. So we still have a few more minutes here. So if there are any other questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box on the left side of the screen. I just want to touch on a few of the questions that we fielded to all of you throughout the session, especially those around uh, how often you use GPS and what you would do if it wasn't there. I, I was thinking about those myself and realized that even if I'm not using my GPS to get from point A to point B, let's say uh, in my car when I really need it, then uh, I'll use it on my phone to just calculate how long it takes me to get somewhere. And I forget that the first step of that is asking my phone to find where I am right now. So I think if we all were to stop and really think about how often we use GPS, it's uh, times when we're even not thinking actively about navigation. Right. And also it comes up a, a lot when, when people aren't thinking about it. About As I said, next, next time you're in the grocery store or any store, just look at the you know, the goods that are on sale and think about where all these things came from. You know, these you might see manufactured goods that have been transported from somewhere in Asia. You might see, uh, uh, at, uh, like I said, produce that came from somewhere in South America. Uh, these things come from very far away, and it really is an interesting sort of connection and navigation story that all of these things are accessible uh, to you. Uh, and it, it really comes up maybe form foremost in your mind where you turn on the GPS, but even when it's not there, there really are these underlying systems that make it possible for all these, uh, for you to have access to these sorts of things. Now you were talking a little bit about some of the different systems that are being built, some of them globally, some of them just for the specific countries. Now GPS being open, as you described, Will it be possible for countries to build these systems in a closed way, or will we ever have to deal with roaming charges for our <laughs> our, our location services? It is possible to build these satellite systems in different ways. You could encrypt the signal so that you so that only certain kinds of equipment can use it. Uh, and in fact, the way GPS works today is that it is open to everybody. But there is a second set of signals that only military users have access to. Um, and those, that second set of signals is a, is a more precise code. It enables a quicker determination of, of signal and, 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 and more precise positioning. Uh, but, um, so all the applications that we're used to using on our daily life, and even mo almost all the applications that professional surveyors use, the stuff that I've done even in the field, uses that non-military part of the signal. So it's not, in, not encrypted. Um, uh, the other systems, uh, I rem uh, the, one of the um, ideas for uh, the Galileo, the European system, that it would have, that that would be instituted as, as part of a way to uh, help pay for the system, that there would be some sort of way that you'd have to pay a licensing fee or something like that. But that, those, that part of the plans went away a long time ago, probably because of the existence of GPS, because it is you know, freely available like that. So um, we're in this world where the signals that actually do determine precise uh, uh, positioning actually are freely uh, accessible, and, and I don't see that changing any time in the foreseeable future, at, at least when it comes to GPS. Hmm. Well, very interesting. Thank you. And that actually brings us to just about the end of our time here, so I just want to launch a couple of things on the screen for our participants. Uh, first off, you'll notice that the evaluation button is back in the top left-hand corner of the screen, and if you haven't had a chance to fill it out yet, we hope that you'll jump in and give us your feedback on the overall conference today. 
I also would like to remind that all of the sessions have been recorded, including this one, and we will be posting those on the conference site, and you'll be able to access those archives, and we'll have those up very soon, so please do check back on the site. Uh, I'd like to just say a big thank you to Dr. Andrew Johnson for not only finishing us off for the day, but joining us at the start of the day and, and giving us some great food for thought throughout. Great. Glad to be here. And uh, a big thank you to our full panel of experts who joined us from the National Air and Space Museum today. And thank you to all of you for joining us for the great questions. And we do hope that you'll continue to stay engaged with us both on Twitter and by checking out the archive recordings and sharing them with other people who weren't able to join live today. So thank you so much. Take care and have a great day.